Well, hello to you. And as always, welcome to this little session when we, we kind of work through the um, material for the community groups. We're now into, I suppose, uh, uh, week eight or more of uh, being in lockdown. And I guess uh, for none of you, it's getting any easier at all. But I hope the opportunity that the community groups afford of just being able to see folk and chat with folk, um, that that kind of helps uh, ease the frustrations of not getting out. Um, and perhaps underlines as well how, uh, in essence, the, the church is always a people who congregate. That's why we call them congregations. We gather together, and uh, it's that that we, we miss. There are a whole lot of other things about the church that uh, carry on, but not the, the coming together in that sort of way. And there is that physicality about the church that uh, we perhaps do well to, to recognize, and uh, this time certainly is, is underlining that. Uh, thank you for the, the feedback that I've had. Some of the, the groups do feedback to me, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, try and take that on board. Uh, one of the groups this past week was feeding back and um, just in uh, um, recognizing uh, how good a thing it has been for uh, some of them to have received cards from the Sunday school. They've really appreciated that. Um, those are kind of an older generation receiving cards from the younger generation. And uh, that, that connection was an important one. And I suppose that's a, a reminder for us always that um, being in touch like that, um, just in those informal ways, is, is an important part of caring the one for the other um, as pastors. Uh, I've always said that uh, everyone has four pastors. Um, uh, first of all, we have God himself. The Lord is our shepherd, is our pastor. Um, then uh, pastor number two is yourself. Uh, we're called to pastor ourselves. Thirdly, uh, our friends, those around us in the Christian church, we, we have a pastoral care for one another, seeking to look out for one another's uh, good and welfare. And uh, where necessary, if all else fails, as it were, um, there are those who are appointed formally as pastors within the life of a fellowship. And, and uh, an integral part of the, the whole pastoral ministry within any church is the, the informal caring for, concern for, contact with one another uh, that uh, has certainly come to the fore quite a lot through the course of these past days. Um, it's also mentioned in terms of feedback, the, the value that there may be in uh, participation. Um, there's a sense in which obviously all of us participate in worship. Um, it's not a spectator sport, we all participate. But the, the use of uh, our varying gifts in one way or another, developing those gifts, an important part of it as well. Uh, families are the stronger when all the members get to, uh, to be playing their part within the life of the family. Uh, all of that's really just feedback from, uh, from last week. This week, we go on to chapter 3 of Ephesians, verses 1 to 13. Uh, the bulk of which, verses 2 to 13, are really a digression. Paul starts off about to pray, and, but he doesn't get to the prayer till verse 14. And all of this is a, a digression, really, um, because he, he kind of feels the need to explain why he, a Jew, should be praying for Gentiles, because Jews... Uh, just didn't do that. And uh, so he, he's really using these verses to explain why, as a Jew, he is now going to be praying for the Gentiles. So uh, on to the study and uh, on to question number one. Now, this uh, question here um, is one that invites you just to have a look at the passage as a whole. And it closes, you'll see in verse 13, with Paul's concern that the Ephesians shouldn't be discouraged. Uh, I think he was probably aware that um, they would be conscious of the fact that he was in prison. And it may have been that uh, that itself kind of uh, worried them. Um, you know, is God really in charge if he can allow Paul to be in prison? And maybe an element, too, of uh, the fear that perhaps that's what would be happening to them in the course of time as well. They'd end up in the, the clink as well. And uh, what Paul is concerned to do is really try and help them um, see their own circumstances, whatever they may be presently, and that's true for us as well, to see all of that against the backdrop of God's eternal purpose. And that does always help get things in perspective. So what he's doing here is really um, uh, spelling out something of the expansiveness of the great 
purpose of God through eternity, one that has been uh, foretold through the course of the Old Testament leading up to the coming of Jesus and uh, issues in eternity as well. So that's question number one. Question two now. The questions in relation to this question um, really relate just to verse 1, and uh, he describes himself as the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. And uh, for him, obviously, it was literally true at that particular juncture. Uh, there is a sense in which, though, that that is the truth about us all. We are um, the prisoners of the Lord Jesus, not in a, in a kind of nasty sense, um, so much as uh, being chained, as it were, to him. Uh, he keeps us safe. Uh, he uh, keeps us in check as well. Um, and it is a reminder we are simply not our own. Sometimes Paul speaks of himself as the slave of Jesus. Same notion as well. Um, and uh, uh, we are simply at his service and glad to be so. And um, what he's, he's talking about here is, is just this remarkable thing that uh, uh, Paul, the quintessential Jew, is yet committed under God to Gentile ministry. And uh, that uh, would have raised a, a good few eyebrows in the ancient world, a Jew with Gentiles. Um, uh, and yet, uh, when we pause and think about it, uh, we do well to, to recognize that uh, that is as nothing compared to um, the, the manner of the ministry of Jesus, uh, the great creator condescending to be with his creatures, a holy God coming to be with sinful rebels. Um, and nothing could be a starker contrast than that. And all that Paul was doing, in a sense, as a Jew with the Gentiles, was simply giving uh, expression to that same basic principle. And uh, it is a challenge to ourselves just to consider uh, whether we actually simply stick with uh, our own crowd, the sort of people uh, that we're comfortable with, people who are like us, uh, in terms maybe of background, in terms of uh, where we live, in terms of education, in terms of uh, interest, etc. Uh, do you simply stick with your own crowd or how comfortable are you with others um, with whom outside of Christ you would have little or nothing in common? Um, my uncle, who was uh, coming on for 97, he died this past week. And it was one of the striking things about him that um, from early on in my life, I, I recognized about him. He would be at the, uh, the, the really posh end, I suppose, of the spectrum, uh, if you were looking at it in terms of uh, uh, social classes and so on. Uh, and yet he had that uh, amazing ability just to get alongside uh, people from all walks in life. And it was, it was a very challenging thing to, to recognize that about him uh, as comfortable in the, the highest echelons of society as with the, uh, the poorest, meanest individuals in society. And, and didn't bat an eyelid um, in, uh, in any of those contexts. Um, uh, just a question there, what are you like? Do you stick with just your own people or is there that expansiveness in terms of your engagement with others? On then to question three. Now, in um, verses two and three, Paul speaks about the, the call of God upon his life. Um, that really is what verse two is about, uh, the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, meaning you Gentiles. Um, he speaks about the, the basic principle behind this, uh, the, the grace God gives to each of us in our particular spheres of calling. He speaks about that in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. It uh, can be helpful just to remind yourself of that and to think through and uh, important to recognize our particular calling as individuals under God. And the, uh, the reason why I referred you to Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 to 17 is because Paul here um, does speak in verse 3 about the mystery made known to him by revelation. 
And he means by that, um, this was not something that, that he kind of figured out himself just by kind of getting to grips with the Bible, but something that the Lord Jesus himself revealed to him. And uh, he, he speaks about that in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 to 17. And those verses are in many ways the backdrop to, to one of the, the most significant academic books uh, that has been written in this connection. Uh, about the, um, the ministry of Paul. It's called The Origin of Paul's Religion by a guy called J.G. Machen. Uh, be well over 100 years old now, certainly. Um, and uh, what, what Machen was, was um, arguing was precisely this, that um, Paul got his religion, as it were, got the gospel that he proclaimed direct from Jesus himself. Um, and the reason why he was writing that book was because there was, uh, and still is to some extent, a common argument that, uh, that the gospel that Paul proclaimed is actually somehow different from uh, the, the basic, simple message of Jesus. And Machen uh, wrote this book to, uh, to demonstrate uh, manifestly that that's simply not the case, that Paul's gospel is uh, directly from Jesus himself. And uh, it's, uh, it's a fascinating book if you've got the, um, uh, the stamina for it. Uh, it, uh, it involves some careful reading, but it's, it's well worth the study. And it's a book that simply has not been answered um, uh, down through the years since then. And Paul was, was uh, uh, keen to impress that truth upon the Galatians in Galatians chapter 1 uh, because his own credentials in many ways were bound up with the credentials of the gospel. And the Galatians were, were uh, thinking in terms of dismissing the gospel that they would heard because they were happy enough to dismiss Paul. Paul says, you can't do that. I got my gospel from the Lord. So that's question three. On to question four. And in uh, this question, we're looking at verses four and five, um, where I pick up on this word mystery. Um, I indicated on Sunday that uh, mystery is uh, a favorite way of Paul referring to the gospel. Uh, he makes reference to that in Romans chapter 16 at verse 25 and 26, uh, at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7, for instance, Colossians chapter 1 verse 26 and 27, uh, the mystery again is how he speaks of it, and the, the classic verse that is hung up in any number of church crashes uh, uh, from 1 Corinthians 15, lo, I tell you a mystery, um, we uh, shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. And uh, many a crash has that verse of the Bible put there as an apt statement of what happens in the crash. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And anyone who wants to help in the crash, uh, just give us a call. We'll be happy to take your, um, your service when we resume. What, uh, what wasn't clear, clear certainly to, to folk, um, in times past was both the scope of the gospel, namely it was to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews, and also consequently to some extent the nature of the gospel. Now that's not because God hadn't made that clear, because very clearly he, he had in that original promise to Abram in chapter 12 of Genesis, uh, he spells it out that the blessing that is being narrowly focused to start with on Abram and his uh, descendants is always with a view to the nations being blessed, uh, which is why in the immediately preceding part of Genesis, uh, there is that long catalog of what basically are the nations, as if God's saying at that point, just before he gets down to the, the specifics of Abram and his family and his descendants, and with the Jews, uh, I haven't forgotten the nations. This is all with the nations in mind. Now, the, the Jews um, just did not really grasp that. Um, it was something that, that only increasingly became clear to them. Uh, they hadn't grasped the scope of the gospel. And as a result also, they tended not necessarily to, to get the nature of the gospel. Uh, thinking that um, it was because they were Jews 
that they were in favor with God. In other words, because of their pedigree and uh, other Jews um, who, who didn't uh, simply rely on that uh, assumed it was because of their performance. And so you had these two strands within Judaism, basically this two, these two slight distortions of the gospel. Those who assumed it was all to do with their pedigree and they were okay because they, they could trace their line back to uh, Abram and those who relied on performance and assumed therefore increasingly that it was uh, all to do with the degree to which they had been righteous and conformed to uh, what the law of God said um, and uh, just didn't get it, uh, says Paul. Uh, they required uh, the, the Holy Spirit to, to reveal the uh, nature of the gospel and the scope of the gospel. And you'll see at the end of verse 5, there's the reference to uh, to the Spirit revealing these things to God's holy apostles and prophets. And I think here, the reference, uh, someone picked this up on um, the previous uh, week in connection with uh, the fact that in verse 19 of chapter 2, uh, verse 20 rather, chapter 2, uh, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And, uh, and I would suggested then that that's actually a reference to the New Testament authors, the apostles, and the Old Testament authors, uh, the prophets, uh, commonly so called. Um, I, I don't think that's the reference here, though, and it's, it's too simplistic simply to assume that any time you see that phrase, apostles and prophets, it always refers to the same thing. I think the context here is different, and what uh, Paul is speaking about here is um, the, the way in which the Spirit of God uh, himself reveals this, both to... Uh, to those who are the formal authoritative um, ministers of the word of God in the New Testament, the apostles, and also those who also uh, exercise a prophetic ministry, bring the word of God um, only by the Spirit revealing to them the nature and the scope of the gospel could they uh, bring the message of God to the people. So that's, uh, that's question four. On to question five. Now, question five focuses very particularly on verse six, and in some ways, it was this verse in particular that uh, uh, we, we focused on um, uh, towards the end on Sunday past, because here there is a summary statement of what the mystery actually is. Remember, mystery is, is not something that is just kind of weird and off the radar, but something that needs to be revealed to us and at the same time is something so wonderful that, that we can't um, really fully fathom its, its great depths. And here Paul explains basically what that mystery is, at least in outline. And uh, I was trying to explain uh, on Sunday past that in essence the mystery is that promise, uh, the gospel as a promise, um, something that is guaranteed because God himself undertakes to do it. It's um, not a contract where God says, I will do this if you do that. Uh, it is a covenant where God says, it doesn't matter how poorly you conduct yourself, this is what I commit myself absolutely, unconditionally to be and to do. So it's a promise. And that promise is, first of all, in Christ. You'll see how that's how verse 6 ends, the promise in Christ Jesus. So it is in relationship with Christ Jesus that we come to know and enjoy the promise of God in all its fullness. Secondly, it is for all, this promise. Um, the mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. And um, that, that was something that um, was just uh, something, it hit like a bombshell, the, uh, the ancient world. Um, it is for all, uh, very wonderfully. And, and it is by grace, uh, not something that we could ever earn or deserve. And uh, we do well to, to recognize that. You'll see there in verse 6, the, the three times over, the together with, together with, together, uh, that underlined by Paul are being brought together by God. It is his doing, and we get to share in the promise, and we get to share in the service of Christ as well as part of his body. And I asked the question, what would you say were the implications of this for us in our life as a fellowship of God's people? And it's worth pondering that the, the degree to which 
the, the different facets of our life, the way that we are, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we go about church makes it clear that Jesus is for all. One of the things that um, uh, slightly troubling, I suppose, for uh, the leadership team at the moment is the awareness that um, uh, because of the government restrictions and so on, what, what can seem to be the case is that the gospel really and the enjoyment of the gospel and being a part of his people is, um, is for those who have the internet. If you've got the internet, you're, you're fine because you can press any number of buttons and get access to any number of worship services and this, that, and the next thing. But, but if you don't have the internet, um, how does that place you? And it can feel to some in our society for all sorts of reasons, not just because of uh, technology, but for all sorts of other reasons as well, that actually Jesus isn't really for them. That's not something clearly enough communicated to them. And the question is, is there really, how do we communicate in every part of our life that Jesus is for everyone? On then to question six. Now, question six looks at verses seven, eight, and nine. And I refer to you to the passage in First Timothy, uh, chapter one, verses 12 to 14. It's one of my favorite passages, uh, if you're allowed to have favorite passages in the Bible, um, where, where Paul simply outlines um, how extraordinary it is that he should have been called by God to share with Jesus in the ongoing work of God. Um, when he, on his own admission, was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man. And yet, despite that being the truth about him, a truth that he was very well aware of, so that he speaks later in that passage of himself as being the chief of sinners. And here he speaks of himself as the least of all the Lord's people. That's uh, uh, what he, he genuinely understood himself to be because of his past. He, he just um, was bottom of the pile, really, entirely. Um, not something that he, he deserved at all. And yet, despite all of that, uh, the Lord counted him trustworthy, was prepared to trust him. And that's a, a wonderful reality. Um, and, and the reason why the Lord does that is because he is confident of his own sustaining grace, confident of the sufficiency of his own grace, so that when God calls us to uh, fulfill a, a certain responsibility, God is confident of his own ability to enable us to do that. Um, if he wasn't, uh, and if we didn't know that, then we'd be uh, up the spout completely. And so that's, uh, that's question six. On then to the final question, question seven and verses 10 to 13. In these last verses, um, Paul really expands what he's been saying out onto a, a much larger canvas and tries to set out what it is that God has been doing by bringing the gospel of his grace in Christ Jesus to the Gentiles as well and bringing together those who hitherto have been um, disunited, disconnected, and at odds with one another. And far from being simply a matter of uh, benefiting and enriching Jews and Gentiles, humanity in other words, there is, Paul says, a, a far larger purpose behind that in the mind and plan of God. Um, and that purpose is, is really to, to display, to make known uh, through the church what he calls the manifold wisdom of God and make that known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Um, so that in, in many ways, what Paul is saying is that the church is essentially God's shop window. Um, not just for the world around us, in whatever generation we happen to live, but for the, the spiritual rulers in the heavenly realms. Because in the life of his church, and in the way in which he brings together 
those who are so hostile to one another in terms of background, uh, in terms of perspective, in terms of all their former life, uh, and breaking down those barriers and, and bringing about that extraordinary unity through this astonishing uh, plan that he has had whereby he satisfies at one and the same time the demands of his justice and the dictates of his mercy by sending his son Jesus to do for us and to bear for us what the requirements of justice uh, demand and um, thereby uh, the fruit of that seen in people who are renewed as well as forgiven people who are brought together and reconciled uh, as well as made anew uh, in the church God uh, reveals and makes known uh, to the world at large and to the rulers in the heavenly realms the, uh, the wisdom that is his, the, the extraordinary, perfect wisdom of God, this God whose ways are perfect in all things. And, and the church becomes the shop window in which that becomes evident, uh, just the remarkable capacity of God to do what humanly is impossible. Um, when we're in Campbellton, in the free church there, um, it's just a small congregation um, comprising um, just a, a few uh, individuals, uh, and they, they are very varied individuals. Some would have um, quite a, a significant background in the Bible, uh, and others, uh, there was a guy there called Alex who was uh, just a tinker um, by background, a traveling person, uh, ill-educated um, and uh, just with all sorts of baggage in his life. And I remember the, the occasion when uh, Professor Donald McLeod came and preached and seeing in the, uh, the chat afterwards, uh, this eminent professor, this uh, academic of, of huge stature academically and, and great, um, great usefulness in the service of God down through many years, um, chatting away to, to this guy from the traveling people and uh, being uh, just uh, obliged to think you, you simply would not see that anywhere else but uh, a measure of what it is that God does in bringing together the most unlikely people and uniting them in Christ and that all pointing forward to what it is that he uh, will do and will bring to completion in uh, the new heavens and the new earth. And uh, once we see that, that that's what God is committed to, then it stands to reason, first of all, that we will be crying out to him in prayer and reliant on him. We'll be saying, Lord, we, we need you to help us live like that. And at the same time, uh, we will appreciate, um, uh, the more we appreciate this, then the more we will learn to rest in him and the confidence that uh, God is big enough and able enough to, to do that. And therefore, we will, we will look to him and not be discouraged uh, because of anything that happens. We'll know that God himself is at work for his own glory in our life as his people. And may that be the case. And uh, it is always my hope, my prayer, that as you take the opportunity through the community groups, uh, you'll enjoy simply being with folk who, who are different from you in some ways, um, know the stimulus of different perspectives, different insights, the uh, blessing and encouragement of uh, good friends in Christ uh, whom the Lord has brought uh, together. And all of that, a foretaste, a small, small foretaste of a far, far greater gathering that uh, will one day come when we bow together before the majesty of our Savior God. So I hope you've enjoyed this study. We'll be continuing with the next step uh, in uh, the second part of chapter three next week. And uh, I hope that uh, that too will be a benefit to you.